Hey everybody, it's Savage Lands News coming in this week with our second video in the Hero Introduction series. This time we're going to be focusing on Dromai, the Ash Artist. So, right now, why would you want to play Dromai? Um, she has probably one of the most unique playstyles in the game. Ally, focused, she summons things, leaves them on the table, and your opponent has to interact with your cards over a long period of time. Um, you know, other heroes have some sort of summoning, right? Chain had one thing, Lev Vaya had one, um, Ally or Prism had auras, but Dromai's uh, creatures are much more tangible in nature, right? They have a health pool, they regenerate. Um, so she's a very unique playstyle. Um, she also has two to three supported playstyles right now, unlike some other heroes that really only have like one direction they go. You're going to see Dromai's that lean more on the aggro side, playing things like four go agains, um, the zero cost dragons, and and three go agains. And then you're going to see one more, much more focused on dragons. So like a tempo based dragon plan, or even a much more turtly defensive type dragon plan. So she has a lot of like room of discovery and, and expression. And both lists have actually done pretty well. You've seen some aggro lists run uh, do well at Brattle Hardens. You've seen a tempo based dragon one do well at Worlds. So they all seem to be pretty strong in the right hands. And speaking of strong in the right hands, this hero probably is one of the most rewarding heroes for her dedicated like players, right? Um, a very, very, very good Dromai is leagues and bounds different from your average one, right? She's kind of got a complex game plan. Her game plan changes from game to game. She really rewards a lot of time and dedication. She's a new hero. She doesn't have very many Living Legends points. She's not gaining a significant amount of them either, so she's probably going to be around for a while, which is a very good thing to have. Um, and if you're into pitch stacking, this is the hero for you, right? Amazing second cycle, third cycle, amazing long game plans. Um, kind of feeds back into that dedication, right? But there aren't very many decks that I fear as much as I fear Dromai on the second cycle, right? Um, and another one of the unique things about Dromai is she is exceptionally good into Wizards. So right now, Wizards are gaining popularity. Icelander, obviously, the main one. Kano seems to be coming out of the woodwork recently, so... If there's a lot of wizards in your local area, Dromai has a great, great matchup into those heroes. And number one reason for a lot of people, Dromai has shiny, kick-ass, dragon, cold foil cards everywhere, right? Um, huge amount of cards to collect for her. Very flashy deck. Pretty awesome. So we're looking at all these reasons of why we would want to play her. Why wouldn't you want to play her? Um, I would say Dromai is a really skill-intensive uh, much more than an, an average hero. Um, playing Dromai for Nationals, um, that couple of months of really executing and training and learning the Dromai deck, I actually got much better as a player in general. My pitch stacking was immaculate. Uh, it's like a skill you really need to understand with Dromai. And I actually took a lot of those skills that I got from really practicing Dromai and put them into my Reinar decks. And I think it showed. Um, but she's really skill in intensive. You need to practice a lot. Another downside is long games, right? If you're going to be playing 15 games over the span of two days, Dromai is going to be taxing. She takes a lot of time to win. You know, it's it's kind of a common thing in my local shops nowadays that like the last two players playing are the Dromai Mirror or the old him Dromai game, right? Um, you don't, you're not going to have very much time between rounds on an average, and you're going to have to be playing for a lot longer than the other players around you. Um, another reason you might not want to play Dromai is that she's weaker into why go wide decks so think Katsu and Fi, probably the pinnacles of that right um the wider the player can go the more they can deal with your dragons the more damage they can do to you the more on hits they can threaten right um so if you have a shop that is just kai of Fies and Katsus, you know you're gonna have a hard time um another one of the weird things about Dromai is she doesn't have a weapon so in some ways that leaves her open to certain strategies, counter strategies. Um, you know, you, you, if you run out of dragons, you run out of threats. You can't just fatigue with a weapon like a, a lot of other heroes have as a default options. 
Um, her dragons all trigger on hits. As long as the card says if this hits, and it doesn't say if this hits a hero, it will activate on a dragon. So your opponents can do things like draw cards off Mask of Momentum on your dragons. They can hit your dragon with a snatch and draw a card. They can trigger on hit abilities, right? Then depending on the matchup, that is a bad thing. And you have to keep that in mind. Dory can stack her sabers on your dragons, right? Um, uh, one of the biggest differences between Prism and Dromai is that her cards all have Phantasm on them. Every one of her dragons is popable by six, which means that your game plan into heroes with six plus power drastically changes. It also means that some decks who run a handful of sixes can just randomly in the game turn off your turn, right? If you're not, if you don't have a, a second plan. Um, she has a unique deck by building constraint in which she, all of her ash is generated off of reds and ash is necessity to playing her dragons. So she is a much more red leaning deck um, and does have a, a deck constraint, right? It's harder to play yellows and blues in her. And then final, final bad thing we've talked about a little bit. She does have some bad matchups and you know, I would say those matchups are pretty bad. Um, but on average, she kind of has that illusionist syndrome where she has a lot of really good matchups, a lot of skill matchups, and a couple bad ones. It just so happens that the bad ones right now are pretty bad, right? So speaking of bad matchups, what does her spread look like right now? Um, you know, there's, there's probably a lot of debate in this one, I would say. But her good matchups, typically wizards, uh, people who can't deal with multiple dragons a turn very well, how, like, you know, Azalea has to go really tall, invest a lot of time and energy into a single arrow. And if that arrow goes into a dragon, like, you're winning the game, right? Um, Anti-wizard cards, uh, you know, a lot of people <laughs> don't think this. It was initially when she came out, they thought Dorinthia was going to be her worst matchup. I believe she has a great Dorinthia matchup. And obviously the Assassin, probably the Assassin's worst matchup in the game. A lot of skill matchups here in the middle. You know, Old Him is probably on the harder side. Dash is on the harder side. Um, Levy is also a little bit on the harder side, um, but you can beat and lose to basically every hero in this middle section. I mean, you can still lose to your great matchups, but it's much harder than these ones. And then down on the bottom, right, the main three worst matchups, I would say, Viscerai, Katsu, and Fi. Fi and Katsu, especially if they're running Mask of Momentum and um, Kadachis, right, they're just going to kill your dragons, draw cards, and then kill you. Right, very hard to deal with. Viscerai's uniqueness is that you know he can still kill a dragon, get a non-hit, and send arcane your direction. It is kind of he gets to play both sides of the field, unlike most heroes. And then Bravo and Reinar, you know, they both just they have their six quantity deck, but they're a little faster than the rest of them. And you could argue Leviya that way too. But with you know, Reinar can take a turn off and deal with your dragons without imploding, right? Um, Bravo can just dominate, 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 on hit, on hit, on hit, and kill you before you get to your second cycle. Um, so she, I would say, has got a pretty good matchup spread, right? The real problem right now is probably Fi. You know, Fi is one of the most popular decks, probably the go to deck outside of like Icelander. Um, and that is pretty bad, but. Those Dromai players who practice and practice and practice do exceptionally well into the field. They always get top eight. She's always floating around. It's pretty crazy, right? So going into that good, what makes a, the difference between like an average Dromai and a great Dromai player? I'd say pitch stacking is your number one thing, right? There are certain decks like Old Him where you're not going to win the game for a very long time. And that time... And energy in the first cycle is going to be set building your game plan to win in the second or the third cycle, right? So things like stacking Chromies and Miragis next to each other um, to have this kind of will go over the top of your six cards in your hand turn in the second cycle. Or building a deck win con where you get down, hold them down the 20, 18 health, you're going to be playing uh, Tomultai twice, popping all of their AB, and then you've pitch stacked your burn them alls and you lots of little baby dragons um, to kind of burn out them with A, B over the course of the game. So pitch stacking, really important. And then understanding win cons by hero. Dromai has a very different way she deals with each hero, it feels like, right? You've got really long second, third cycle game plans. You've got your arcane burnout game plan. 
You've got your tempo, like um, Toma Fiendal game plan against some of the aggro decks. You've got your, you know, triple stacked um, Rake the Embers against things like uh, Item Dash, right? There's a lot of different ways and different mechanics you're going to need to understand for every single different matchup, right? Um, or a Mage Master Boots, right? Um, ghostly Touch combos for, I don't know, Old Him or Rhinar or somebody like that, right? A lot of different things you have to do and to think about while you're building that game plan. You need to have quick decision making. Um, you, it's very hard to make decisions on Dromai when you're thinking so far ahead, but you also have to react to what's happening right now. Sometimes against Old Him, just to buy yourself a turn, you're going to have to drop a Miragi that you, you know, you maybe wanted to pitch stack, right? Are you going to have to throw that, you know, blue aura on the table, even though you know he's going to pop it, but you just needed to buy time. And so there's a lot of quick decision making, depending on the game state, how much health you have, all of that kind of stuff, right? Um, and then understanding health first board state. Droma is one of those heroes where you kind of walk over at the table, you see it, it's like Droma is at 11 health, their opponent's at 35, and you're like, oof, that's not looking so good. And you go back, you come back 10 minutes later, and suddenly Droma is at 11 health and the opponent's at 6, and you're like, what has happened, right? Droma trades board or health over the course of a game, a lot like Prism did, to build this board state. So understanding how much health you can give up for the tempo you're going to get later on in the game is really, really, really important. And it's a skill that most Dromai's need to master pretty quickly. And then blocking, right? Um, Dromai needs to make it to the second cycle. A lot of the time, you know, a lot of her game plans revolve around 20 to 30 minutes. So understanding what to block and what not to block, what to pitch deck, what not to pitch deck, how to survive, what cards you can give up, really important. Okay, so... Now that we kind of have like a general idea of Dromai, let's go into what her deck list compositions tend to look like. And I'll be going over a couple of like the top lists out there. All right, see you then. Okay, so deck building construction. All right, so here's an example. Um, this is the top eight list from Worlds. Um, you know, I reviewed this one, some of the battle hardened lists that have happened recently, even the list that I was running uh, with my teammate over around Nationals. A lot of them are pretty similar, so you know, don't take this one as exactly it. You're going to see these shift a little bit in each direction, especially depending on your local meta, but we'll start it off, right? So Dromai is a deck list that revolves around red cards, right? So as you can see, 54 of uh, the 72 cards that he had available in his deck for this tournament are reds, right? You're going to see a handful of yellows. These yellows are typically tech cards. They are only in the deck as a necessity for a game plan. And then blues. Now, one of the hard things to balance with Dromai specifically is that certain dragons, I think Tomaltai, Dominia, and um, Optimai, um, very, very expensive, right? They're expensive. And so you're playing this deck with all reds. There has to be some blues in your deck to be able to get them out. Right, whether that's an e pot that you're gonna put on the table early, so then when you when it comes up, you can just pop them and pull it out. Whether that's a couple of blues that you're gonna pitch stack, so typically your blues in the deck are there for matchups that require the expensive dragons, and you want always want a handful in there just so you can play Tomaltai, right, um, or Dominia when they come up. So looking at this list, right, 54 blues, four yellows, and 14, or sorry. 54 reds, 14 blues, and 4 yellows. You're going to see 25 invokes in there, right? Almost half of your playable cards are dragons. Uh, you know, Dromai revolves around dragons, unless you're playing the much more aggro variant with things like Ravenous Rabble, Blazing Hedgehog, um, all of those kind of cards, right? You're going to have a very dense amount of dragons. So let's dive into his list real fast. Start with the equipment. Dromai has a lot of flexible equipment pieces, right? Um... One of the things that I think also kind of helps her be so malleable and, and, and powerful is a lot of different equipment pieces to use. Typically you're going to see, you know, I find it interesting this person ran Arcanite Skullcap, but Arcanite Skullcap probably just to buy them one additional health against those aggro matchups. Arcanite Skullcap or Crown are probably going to be your two most common head pieces. Flamescale Furnace, I think, literally will never come out. Um, I mean, originally you saw some like Tom of or Fendal's spring tunics but flamescale furnace 
I should have actually put that in as one of the required skills in mastering Dromai, but Flamescale Furnace is incredible for Dromai. It generates an Ash. It allows you to pitch stack very effectively. Um, so on turns that you couldn't have necessarily dumped all four of your cards, you can do that now, right? Flamescale Furnace and mastering this card do separate good Dromais from average Dromais, right? Playing at one cost, pitching or furnacing, getting two resources, generating an Ash, Playing a two-cost card like a CNC, really pivotal to your game plan. Then you're gonna have your two or your three glove options, right? You're gonna have Ghostly Touch, very interesting card. Every time one of your cards with Phantasm is popped when you attack with it, you gain a counter. At the end of the game, I've seen this card get to 20 counters before, right? In the second cycle, with a non, with a you know a semblance or a um, you know, aura that eliminates Phantasm on the table, you can actually attack with uh, your Ghostly Touch for like 11, 15, right? With no Phantasm. And that is a good way to seal the game. So you use this for like Old Him, Bravo, sometimes Reinar, right? Um, other than that, Silken Form is typically the card you're going to be running. It's just a block one that generates an Ashwing. Sometimes you can catch opponents slipping when they calculate exactly how much they need to defend with. And then they forgot to count the one coming from Silken Form, and you can rip the last card out of their hand and, you know, crumble the game plan. Other than that, you have Null Rune. That's just so you start the game with some, right? You don't have to take an unnecessary amount of damage early before you can get all your Ash Wings on the table. In case you didn't know, Ash Wings, each Ash Ring has AB1 on it, which is one of the other reasons she's so good into Wizards. And then your boot options are either going to be Mage Master Boots or Phantasmal Footsteps. Mage Master Boots are better for that combo. Um, it allows you to drop a zero cost aura on the table or play Tome of Fiendal immediately um, with a go again, right? Um, so that enables you to do like uh, Mage Master Boots into Anti Phantasm Aura into Ghostly Touch with no Phantasm. Or Mage Master Boots, Tome of Fiendal, draw three cards, play four dragons, go again, right? Stuff like that. And then Phantasmal Footsteps are just an amazing blocking card, right? They, they are good into item dash. They allow you to play your Phantasm cards into popper decks and then get your action point back. It does not work on dragons, by the way, so just keep that in mind. And then you only have one weapon choice. I don't think this will ever come out. But looking at the list, right, we're going to look at the yellows first because those are the tech cards. Tom of Fiendal. Remembrance. Typically, your yellows are going to be your yellows are going to be something along the lines of one or two remembrances, and one to three tomes. Um, tomes allow you to do multiple things, right? One, it gains health over the long course of a game, which is pretty amazing. But against aggro decks, playing a tome of Fiendal and dropping three to four dragons can buy you the tempo you needed to win. Um, and remembrance is just amazing, like in the mirror, right? Whoever has more Asvalize and more um, Rake the Embers tends to win into old him it allows you to pull tomatai up a second time for burn them all it allows you to pull up dominia or more miragis a second time or more chromis right depending on what the game state is and then your blues you're going to see a lot of interesting choices for blues passing mirages are there for the long fatigue matchups um, guardians mostly you're going to see it against reinar to buy turns levia to buy turns um, amazing blue pretty much a solid I was running Time Snap Potion. It's just another one of those wombo combos. You can play that early in the second cycle. You can do something that kind of like really breaks their ability to pop all your cards. You're going to see E-Pots from time to time. But in this list, you know, yeah, here you are. Your, your Energy Potions, your Ember Moss Sanipies, your Passing Mirages, a Time Snap Potion, Sweeping Blows just to generate Ash. And then I'm seeing Pursuit Knowledge come up a lot. I never ran it, but it seems like a good idea. Um... And you're going to cut your blue ratio down depending on the matchup, right? If you're running those big dragons, you're going to want more. If you're not running the big dragons, you're going to want to cut it down, okay? And then your reds. So you're going to see almost every one of the dragons in a lot of the lists, right? As well as Chrome Eyes, Dominia, Kyloria, Miragis, right? The dragons that tend to be negotiated on, like, quantity are the Necrias, the Uvias and the Thamais. Those tend to be the ones that flex the most I've seen out of almost every list, but basically every other dragon is almost always in. The rest of the reds are going to be your D reacts, your sweeping blows, some attacks, right? This list has Miraging Metamorph. I never personally ran it, 
but Spears of Serility, Miraging Metamorphs, Ember Moss Enterprise, Dune Breaker Enterprise, Command and Conquers, Erase Faces. It's those are your kind of tech cards for the local meta or the tournament you're walking into. And then everything else is kind of a staple, right? Ravel, another one of those cards. It's like a if you want to be more aggressive, you run those like four go agains, right? So keep in mind main things when building Dromai is have a game plan for each one of the heroes. Ensure that your reds are dense enough to support the Ash generation. Ensure you have enough blues in your deck to summon your expensive dragons. And then think about how many Remembrances, Toma Fiendals. Honestly, yellows are really specific cards that you're going to run for specific game plans. Um, other than that, you're, you're probably not going to be running any yellow copies of any other card. All right. So let's get into some play patterns after this. Okay. So before I actually wanted to get into play patterns, um, I think Droma is one of those decks that's actually kind of very hard to give a brief intro for um, because she has such complex matchups. Um, so before I go into these play patterns and kind of show you what I'm going to do drawing the cards, playing them, I kind of want to go over what I think is really important to her, which is understanding your game plan before the game starts, right? So I have broken her list down a little bit. Now, I didn't create this world's list. This is not my list. Um, so I don't know the exact ideas and the exact thoughts that went into it. And so the best I can really do is kind of express what was going through my head when I was playing Dromai before each game. And I'll do my best to explain probably what this person was thinking. You know, I might be way off base here. But so typically I would have like a core, a core deck, right? And this could change a little bit over time. But for me, there was a couple cards that didn't really come out, right? Burn the Malls were, you know, zero go agains that enabled my dragons, right? Amber Moss and Pies Blues, just good. You're going to see a lot of these zero cost dragons in here. Uh, Asvali, Chromai, a one cost dragon, Kyloria, Miragi, Yenderai, who's just really good, Raked the Embers, Sigil of Solaces, all my sweeping blows, right? Those are just like good cards. Dominia too. I think this card's just basically good in every matchup, right? So I would almost always kind of start from this, what I called like a foundation. They're good in every game plan. Fatigue, aggro, they're just, they're just good, good, good dragons and sigils and things that enable your dragons to go again with one card, right? So I'd always start with this and your sweeping blows for Ash Generation. At one point I moved away from the red ones, but I could see why everybody wants them. They're just, here's a bunch of free Ash in the early game, amazing. So I'd take this core list, 33 cards, and then I'd look at my equipment. So, you know, your helmet always stays the same and your chest piece always stays the same. So those two decisions are made. I would then look at my opponent. If I'm going into a wizard, I'd probably put in my Nolrin Gloves. If I'm going into a six heavy deck, think Bravo, Old Him, Reinar, Levia, Levia, um, I would run Ghostly Touch if I thought it would be beneficial, you know? And depending on how the matchups or the meta is currently at the time, if Ghostly Touch is going to get benefits, run it, right? If you're going to survive long enough to be able to play a Ghostly Touch combo in the second cycle or, you know, end of the first cycle if you're lucky, do it. But if you're going to get killed too fast, where Ghostly Touch doesn't get value, then I'd probably go with Silken Form, okay? And then your boots are really, really, really important because they have way different play styles. Phantasmal Footsteps, if you're going against Item Dash, you don't always know that, but it is good against it. Um, also, if you anticipate on running a bunch of poppable attack cards, Spears of Serility, Doom Breaker, Senate Pie, Miraging, Metamorph, your Blue Ember Maws, Red Ember Maws, so on, right? This card becomes way better if you add in these, you know, these poppable cards. Mage Master Boots are going to be added if you're doing Passing Mirage combos, Ghostly Touch combos, or Toma Fiendel combos. And you need to get one guaranteed free one out. You need a guaranteed Passing Mirage combo, a guaranteed Toma Fiendel. Like maybe you can't rely on your Chromite always working, right? That's when you would run those boots. So starting with your game plan like that is super important on Dromai, right? Once I've uh, picked my game plan, I would move into the decisions for the rest of the cards, right? Um, your defensive cards, are these valuable, right? Um, do they have on hits that are going to be directed at your face? Are you not going to have a lot of dragons, right? Um, 
So sand cover, sink below, fate for seeing, you know, am I playing against a Dorinthia? These are going in. Am I playing against a, a Bravo? These are going in. Am I playing a really long second cycle game plan? These are going in, right? These help you dig for cards. They help you replace cards. They help you get to the second cycle faster. They help you survive. Um, will my Chrome Eyes give me guaranteed action points throughout the game because they don't run very many sixes? These are going in. Do I plan on needing to have a massive tempo turn in the first cycle? These are going in. Um, am I planning on fatiguing my enemy or going very long with burn them all combos, then remembrance will go in. Is it the mirror remembrance goes in? Your blues, another one of those big decision points, right? And you'll see that some of these dragons I took out, right? Um, each one of these dragons costs three or more, except for Uvia, but we'll get into Uvia and Thamai, but we'll get that to a second. Um, you know, am, am I playing against a six popper deck that I need a second action point? Yes, goes in. Energy potion, same thing. Do I have enough time to set up these potions, put them on the table, and benefit from them? Then they go in. Passing Mirage would probably always stay in. It's just a good blue. But depending on how many blues you have in your deck, like you maybe don't want that many, right, if you're not running any of these dragons. So Passing Mirage is a decision-making pursuit of knowledge. Like, am I going to get benefit from it? In the mirror, this card's probably incredible, right? Um, so you, you can see how having a game plan really dictates what's going in. And then we'll get into these kind of final decision making. Um, Thamai, a lot of the time this will come out because it's just like an okay dragon. It costs more than most of the other dragons. It doesn't do as much damage as most of the other dragons, but this card does turn off d reacts and it turns off wizards. So, I mean, am I playing a wizard? This goes in. Do I need more dragon density? This goes in. Um, Uvia, do I plan on having enough ash where I benefit from this card? Um, Phi, sometimes Briar. I just don't have enough ash floating around to ever benefit from spending two on a one cost dragon, right? So I would take those out. I'd much rather spend my ash on a Vincenrikai or a Tomaltai or, a, you know, a bunch of Chrome Eyes, right? Necria. You know, will I get benefit over the from the course of the game, right? Am I playing in a deck that can just one shot it? Maybe it's not worth it, right? Am I playing in a against a hero that would have to hit it twice and give me two free ash? Goes in. And then my final kind of decision-making points would be around these, like, attacks, right? You know, am I running Footsteps and it's a Popper deck? Okay, then I'll put these in, right? These these Phantasm cards. Um, you know, is it is it a list that has a lot of Poppers and I just don't see myself running Phantasmal Footsteps because I need the Mage Master combo? Then I probably wouldn't run these three and, you know, I'd put in my CNC, my Ravel as an example, hypothetical, right? Does CNC give me any benefit? I'm putting it in, right? So that's kind of like the decision-making process you have to go through before, you know, as soon as you see the hero flipped, you have to go, okay, what's my game plan? And how do I shape my game plan and plan my, my long or short kind of game around that hero? All right, so now we can get into play patterns. Um, I'll just set up the deck generically as if I'm playing against... Uh, we'll, we'll do maybe like a, a fatigue game plan first, and then we'll go into kind of like a tempo-based game plan second. Cool. Okay. So in this hypothetical game plan, we're just going to call this the uh, the the old him game plan, right? We're going for a second cycle. We're going for a ghostly touch or mage masters or um, burn them all close, right? So how would I play? We open up. Let's just say I'm forced to go first. So we're gonna draw our cards here. All right, I don't know what's going on. Oh. Okay. So immediately looking at this hand, it's turn one, we have no Ash, and we have no Baby Dragons, okay? I'll just put counters on these going forward, zero, zero. So what is our most important thing at the beginning of the game? Generate Ash. And I said we're going for that second cycle. So that second cycle means that we need to build Ash and a second cycle game plan to get us across the finish line. So looking at our hand, right, we have one Ash Generation card, we have a Passing Mirage, and we have a Vincent Rakai. Now, we're going to be wanting these zero-cost dragons to come in that second cycle. We don't necessarily want to play, we definitely don't want to play this on our first turn, um, because they're just going to pop it. 
and they've lost nothing. So here, we're gonna go ahead, we're gonna play our Sweeping Blow. Oh my gosh, I don't know what happened. We're gonna pitch a red, and then this red, right? We wanna, we wanna start putting these zero cost dragons down for the second cycle. And we're gonna generate two ash from this. They'll block it, it's turn one. We know that this is gonna be happening. Uh, this play is just to get us started. Okay, two ash generated, they block this card out. And then we have a decision here. We can flame scale furnace and pitch another red, um, generate a third ash turn one and pocket this um, passing mirage. And this might be decent for giving us like a mid game buy, like a turn, or we can flame scale furnace our passing mirage and set it down there for that second cycle. I'm gonna go ahead and do that even though I don't necessarily get this ash but I want to put these two cards down as my investment for the future, right? So we'll go ahead. We played a red, in case you don't know what this does. You, uh, you gain uh, one uh, resource for every red in your pitch zone. Um, and you can only activate this ability if you played a red this turn. So we go ahead and activate Flame Scale Furnace. We have one red in our pitch zone. We gain a resource. And we have three left. It doesn't really matter. We're going to Arsenal. And we pass. Oops. This goes to our graveyard. We drop. We now have Vincent Rakai er, in our um, pocket. We have our D React. We have our Tomaltai. Getting a Tomaltai this early is pretty great, right? Um, unfortunately, we didn't draw a blue to play this Vincent Rakai. This can tend to happen when we put this three cost in our arsenal, right? So now we have to survive a storm here. Say, you know, our old him Bravo opponent kind of throws this big attack at us, right? I'm going to defend. I don't want to defend with any of these cards in my hand, right? This is kind of where the quick decision making starts to come in, right? Do we burn our, our equipment early to save these, like, you know, these really powerful win the game kind of turns? Do we want to eat it all, pitch all three of these cards, you know, all three of these cards down at the bottom, play the Vinny, put this in our pocket? It's hard. So what I'd probably opt to do is D-React the first one put that Maragi down for second cycle and draw a card hoping for the blue right we get it we take some damage we survive we played we played this red immediately flame scale furnace pay okay gain a resource why would i do that because if you look at our second cycle look at this look at this second cycle. we didn't know this existed our second cycle, it's looking delicious. <laughs> it's looking really good, you know what I mean? So we now have a loaded first ha like first draw of our second cycle. And what can we do now? We can play this Vincent Rakai, pitch this, lose an Ash, put this in our arsenal, attack with this, buy a card out of their hand, it'll get Phantasm popped 99% of the time, get a counter on our Ghostly Touch, and go on. Now, this would have been nice to play early. I'm not going to lie. I would have liked to put that down early, but given the importance of this tumult tie, we're going to continue on, continue on. Okay. So what I want to do here, I want to, again, investment of health. It really depends on what they hit us with. If they hit us with something absolutely detrimental, like a Terra Sunder, whatever right i mean although we did rip a full card out of their hand they only have three to four cards in their uh, one in their arsenal maybe i would do everything in my power to play this tumultai so tumultai costs five so looking at his hand let's look you know assuming we can survive the storm it's not that bad they hit us with a, a, a cold four or a warm four they don't it doesn't give us a frostbite let's just pretend i can do something along the lines of play the sweeping blow Generate two ash. Flame scale furnace. Right, we played a red. Generate another ash. Get two resources. Pitch this blue. Go to five. Play Tomaltai. Go to three. Attack with Tomaltai. It's gonna get popped, but we know that that we know that. That's okay. Right? Reveal the top two. 
Now, against Oldham, we have an incredible early start, right? No resources left. If they are running AB, I'd probably go for the AB or the Crown of Seeds. Crown of Seeds, very high priority target. If they have multiple AB, then I'd probably go for the AB. Um, but let's just say this guy is running uh, Crown of Seeds and an Arcane Barrier. Um, typically, I'd probably go for the AB because it is a little bit more awkward in the second cycle. But I could also go for Crown of Seeds since we know what our game plan is. This, we're going to get this Tumble Tie back no matter where the Remembrance is. So in this case, I'd pop his, uh, his or her Crown of Seeds. Call it a day. We... If they block this this sweeping blow and this dragon, they only have two cards left for their turn. We have plenty of ash already, and our second cycle is looking pretty good. Now, say we do the the typical, 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 right? Um, I'd start looking at playing a three dragon turn. So, of my three dragons, block with Yendrai, save some health, go to my turn. Play Uvia. Play Kyoria. Kyoria. Go to zero. And trigger Uvia as it enters the arena. And now we're starting to have a little bit of a board state here. Now, against pop heavy decks, we have no Ash. So this might have actually been a, a dangerous thing to do. I maybe probably, you know, honestly, I might I probably wouldn't have chosen to go down to zero. I, I would prefer to. I actually might not have even played this right. I would consider that maybe a little bit more. I would actually do this, right? Pocket this. Okay, we have one floating. Um, so now we can go ahead and attack with an Ashwing because it is of no loss to us. And we're going to rip a full card for one damage. Or they might let it hit. But the more they let it hit, the more that adds up over time. Attack with this. It dies. Gain that. Um... And then honestly, just put that in Arsenal. So you can see how it's kind of strange. It's hard to show it without an opponent. We're severely opting for second cycle exp explosiveness, right? So we're doing it again. Um, depends what they throw at us. But let's just say they throw another hammer, right? I like, I like, I like what's in my hand. I block with this. I block with uh, one card. Okay, we continue on, continuing on. We choose not to allow it to take our final Ash. We play Kyoria, pitch this down for our second cycle, zero cost dragon. It's Ash neutral. We Furnace, gain a resource, have two floating. We play this. Now, we can choose to attack with it to rip another card. You know, I might throw a Glyori at them. It's, it's, you know, one of these two cards probably throw this at them, right? And then continue on with our game plan, which is eventually getting the second cycle. So eventually over the course of the game, I'm just gonna speed up over time, right? What we're really looking for is, you know, a big wombo combo now. So let's show it. Let's pretend, if you look at what we've pitched stack so far, which I think is the most important thing, zero cost dragon, anti-phantasm dragon, anti-phantasm aura, burn them all for our AB kill. Some blues that unfortunately went down there, a sigil that went down there, you know, a Vinny, and another sweeping blow. But we know that this second cycle is pretty stacked. And as long as we keep throwing these chrome eyes and stuff down there, we're going to have an amazing game plan. So let's just fast forward in time. I'm going to set up a board state and we'll look at executing our game plan based on this like hypothetical pitching. Okay, so we've made it to second cycle. We've hung out. We've used a lot of our d blocked a lot of cards, healed a lot from our sigils and our tomes. And we have an okay board state, right? We have four Ash Wings, a couple dragons on the table, right? It's important, you know, it, it is very difficult for Guardians to pop these, right? It takes a very large attack and a lot of blues for them to kind of hit these cards. So it's typical for them to throw something at you and then pop like an Ashwing or whatever you send their direction. Got our ghostly touch to eight. We've got a energy potion on the table and we have our wombo combo kind of waiting to go. So we draw our, our hand. So right here, you're seeing where the danger is gonna start showing 
in their hands. So one of the most dangerous things we can do um, is play two anti-phantasm cards in one turn, right? So here, seeing this happening, I might immediately be like, okay, it is time. It's time for us to go, right? So I'm going to look at our play. We're going to want to Mage Master Boots probably here, or we're going to want to just drop both. So seeing that we have two passing mirages and he can probably hopefully not have like arouse the ancients or something along those lines to kill both. I'm going to go invoke cost one pitch, right? And then I'm going to send, we're going to send a Clyoria out of him. It's kind of a weird break point. He's going to have to block with a three cost and a one cost and, and a piece of armor or two cards from hand. I'm going to immediately, um, you know, depending on what they block with, right? If they give me two cards from hand, I might push a little bit further, but, and then I'll just end my turn playing a passing mirage and I might just furnace. Uh, I mean, furnacing here is probably not important. So boom, look at our board state. Now, now they're in trouble, right? Let's look again. Okay, we're getting there. So at this point, I would have assumed that I cracked all of their arcane barrier, second cycle. We played the remembrance. We hit a tumble tie again. We're going for it, right? So now they have to make the hard decision which one of these two they're going to kill. Doesn't really make a difference, but they'll probably pop the aura. You know, unless they have go again, and then we're in trouble. But just assume they don't. A lot of the time they don't have enough go again over these long games to do this. They just cracked one of our um, anti-phantasm cards. So now we're open to do this again, right? And and in the second cycle, they might not have that many sixes left in their hand, right? So here um, we're going to sigil. Mm, we might even rake. Let's just rake. Rake. Or four, we're going to go up to seven ash wings. Board state's getting a little bit out of control. We're going to attack with our biggest card. Another weird break point that they're going to have to deal with. Um, that was a mistake, actually. We're going to play burn them all first. It's going to come in for four and one. One unblockable arcane damage. A break point on blocking once again. Come in, no phantasm. And then... I might just consider Mage Master Bootsing here, depending on how many cards he gave me, if they were sixes or non-sixes. If it looks like he might not have enough sixes in their hand, I would go ahead, Mage Master Boots, two floating, play the Passing Mirage, send my army, and see if I break through, right? Because this is just two turns in a row of a breakpoint attack, multiple non-Phantasm cards on the field, We've got our burn them all starting to trigger. We've got an army of ash wings to fatigue the rest of their deck. If they only had two sixes in their hand, you know, they're gonna they're gonna die here, right? We're really looking now for a chromi to kind of seal the deal. So let's just say they managed to survive. Boom. We lost an ash wing. We gained another one of these. Right? Um, I, I could have also ghostly touched on this turn, which maybe was the smarter idea, but if we have the arcane barrier completely nullified, we know that this is our win con. That's what I would invest in. I'm not really worried about doing anything tricky. Boop. All right. Another passing mirage to end our turn on and one of our best phantasm cards. Let's just say he kills another one. We lost two passing mirages. It seems like we're losing the war, but we're not. Invoke Vinny. Pitch a blue. Attack for six on hit three arcane. They're going to give us two cards, right? Two cards, furnace, get this out of our hand. We don't want to see it. Play a passing mirage. They kill a passing mirage again. Somehow they're doing it. Somehow they still have sixes left. They're ripping through all of our cards. Somehow they got it. And look, you look at that. This is what second cycling is all about, right? We tack again, this time with a chrome eye. Okay, invoke Chromite, go down the two ash. Play burn them all. Invoke another Miragi, go to one. 
attack with Vincent Rakai. Six on hit, three arcane. No phantasm. Chromai. Pop it. We gain our action point back. Ashwing. Do they have three sixes in their hand? If they don't, we win. Look at this board state. Four, six, two, three, one. It's a lot of damage. Two more damage. Let's just say they miraculously had it. It's not going great for us, right? Um, they have all three. We lose. We get on the five. But now we're ripping cards out of their hand, left and right. They took two arcane damage, no matter what. Burn them all, right? We're both, I don't know. Just pretend these are blues. It doesn't matter. Going again. And you can see how the second cycle is just unrelenting, right? Unrelenting. Um, Voga Chromai. Come in with a Vincent Rakai, followed up by a Chromai again, followed up by Ashwings. If it got through, they're incredible. We can't believe it. Um, this Remembrance would have been used by now. Uh, I would Furnace, gain a thing, playing the Dominion next turn. Right? You can see how this is this is basically unwinnable. Right? And that, that's how you win. Chromais, Asvalais, Miragis. And as soon as we play this Dominia, right, we've won the game. We could have actually just broken this E-Pot, played Dominia, saw, saw a card, burned it, left them down to three, made them block two, made them block with the, the, their final card in hand, and overran the board state, right? So that's how you play these lines against, like, these fatigue heroes, right? That's what makes Dremai so fun. You're, you're thinking so far ahead. You have multiple ways to win a game, and you're always pivoting between those multiple ways to win the game, whether that's burn them all, whether that's overwhelming the board state with dragons, whether that's fatigue, right? It's really, really exciting and really, really fun. Okay, let's get into combos. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this because I think a lot of the combos are repetitive. Um, this video is already pretty long. Um, <laughs> the problem with an intro series to Drill Mai is that she's complicated, right? I didn't even cover the aggro variant in this video, but that one's a little bit more self-explanatory. Let's get into some lines. So here we are, typical game, some ash, some ash wings, right? No board state, but that's fine. Now, looking at this hand, flame scale furnace is a combo piece, right? As long as you've played a red, you can generate an additional ash. We have this in our arsenal, and looking at this hand, we're not going to do too much with this, right? So we can safely ignore it for now. Now, one of the most devastating lines you can do is play a one-cost card, which we have two of in our hand right now. And you can always choose, like, do I need more ash? We have three ash right now, maybe not. Or do I want a dragon on the table? Both of these will enable our go-agains on our ash wings. Both of these are pretty good, right? So I'm going to opt for my dragon play. I'm going to invoke this dragon. I'm going to pitch this card right here. Generating an ash, subtracting an ash, neutral. Now, if I'm playing against an opponent who does not have poppers, I will safely go four go again on a hit draw card or steal an item. One go again into another one go again. Flame scale furnace, pitching a red for that second cycle. Generating two resource points and ending on a command and conquer. Now, we just played three resources worth of cards for two reds. This is what really makes Dromai dangerous, right? So we've threatened an on-hit draw for four. We've done two damage with our Ash Wings. We're up to six. And we have done six more damage with another on-hit. And if you think about that equation, we've done four cards worth of input for 12 damage, which is like a little bit below rate, but we've threatened two pretty bad on hits. And that's incredible. And one of the things to remember is that Dromai's cards stay until they're dealt with. So we just did, we just did 12, or yeah, we've done 12 damage. Those cards are staying on the table. Two on hits for two reds. Now let's look at another pretty common combo here. And that would be Toma Fjendal Mage Master Boots. And we'll go into a couple more play patterns with these soon. But looking at our hand, we can do something along the lines of pitch a blue, 
two resources floating. Break Mage Master Boots. Play Tome of Fiendal. Down one. Draw two cards. Heal for five. Healing for five. Still have our action point left. Invoke Chromai. Down the two. Invoke Azulai. Down the one. Play a burn them all. Invoke, I don't know, Miragi or Yendurai. Staying at one ash. Four, four for a five card hand. We have just generated a permanent that will probably generate anywhere from three to six to seven to eight value, right? Quite a lot. We've created a three dragon, a, t a three dragon, a three dragon, and we have our remaining board state on the table. This is incredible against aggro matchups, right? Because look at what they have to deal with now. Just in one turn, with one piece of equipment, they now have to deal with four, or if we were smart, three go again, four go again, two and one arcane go again, three go again, one and one, and one additional arcane. And how are they going to, are they, are they really going to be able to kill five dragons, six dragons in their next turn? No. Right? So this is one of those tempo dragon plans. This is how you overrun another aggressive deck. Doing this multiple times over the course of the game, dumping three to four to five dragons in a turn. Incredible. So let's look at another uh, Mage Master Boots combo that is better into Guardian decks. Okay, so let's go over one combo. Um, one of the things I forgot to cover in that last segment was that Chromai also, I mean, probably y'all already knew this, but Chromai gives you an additional action point when you attack with it, right? So that means that you can also use Chromai to play Toma Fiendel from your arsenal. Open up, Chromai attacks, gain two, you know, gain an additional action point, play Toma Fiendel from arsenal, draw a bunch of cards, heal a bunch, and continue on throwing dragons down and attacks on the table, right? But here's a combo more centered on Guardians. So looking at our hand, we have a really big Ghostly Touch, Mage Master Boots, the combo piece in Arsenal, and, you know, enough blues in our hand to fire this. So, a couple things to keep in mind, right? Let's go read these cards in particular, just so you know what they do. Passing Mirage. Your first Illusionist attack each turn loses and can't game Phantasm. Now this is your first attack, and this will always trigger no matter when you play it. The first attack of your turn doesn't gain Phantasm. Ghostly Touch. Once per turn, remove a counter. So we'd go here, you know, go down to three, right? So we'd have 12, 13, 14, 15 attack damage left after we've done that. And this becomes an ally you control with Phantasm, just like our dragons. And it has health and attack equal to the amount of counters on it, right? So there's the additional cost to attack with this card, which is three. And so basically what that means is we can send a big old chonky phantasm attack their direction for three resources. So let's just go over this little combo, right? So if we, we take a look, it's gonna cost us one resource to play Mage Master Boots. It's going to cost us three resources to attack with this card, which we can cover with two floating with these two, right? So what would get us the most value? I mean, normally you'd have a big board state by this point, like a bunch of dragons, right? So, you know, your ash wings, right? Whatever you have on the table. So what we want to do on this turn is I want to play Chromai, play Miragi, one resource floating. Go down, go down. Continue to build our board state. And if this is the second cycle, our opponent is running out of cards, they have low health pool, or whatever it is, right? We can then activate Mage Master Boots, play Passing Mirage, and then attack with our big, enormous, non-phantasmed ghostly touch here, right? So what have we done this turn? We've hit them for 12, 13, 14, 15 damage, which is three more than they can block with the four cards in their hand if every one of the cards blocks four or three. We're probably ripping, you know, typically when you're doing this combo, they're at very low health. So you are threatening like lethal if they don't block with most of this card. And we've built a board state now with two anti-phantasm cards and a chrome eye on the table. 
all in one turn, right? So now not only do they have to deal with blocking this and t possibly taking damage, next turn, if they had to block with every one of the four cards in their hand, they are stuck with these three cards on the table, which means that the next cards, especially in that second cycle, we're looking at a full hand of damage that is going to go over. And the build, the board state you've built up over the course of this game is going to sit there looking at them also. Right? So this is one of those huge ways to win, get that big tempo swing in the end game against these Guardian players. All right, everybody, thanks for hanging out during this video. It was a long one. Dromai is a hard character to kind of do an intro series on. <laughs> I'm starting off with some of the more rough ones, I guess. Um, but I think those of you who dedicate a lot of time and a lot of energy into this hero will see success for a very long time. Especially as we kind of like phase in Living Legend out of some of these more oppressive heroes that will probably be LL'd pretty quickly. You know, Briar and Fi and some of these more aggressive matchups. Um, as soon as those heroes kind of take a step down or or fall out of the, the meta because of Living Legend, Drama is going to be very, very, very strong. Okay, so I think the next hero I'm going to be working on is Bravo. If you guys know any amazing Bravo hero or players, um, if you're an amazing Bravo player, please reach out to me. I'm looking for tips, deck lists. Maybe we can talk about it on stream. That would be amazing. Um, and those of you who've been watching the video for, what, an hour now, thank you so much. Those of you who subscribe, thank you so much. Appreciate it. I'll see you guys next next time.